The war is in the Lebanon, but the world looks on. Today, the fighting is in this particular street of this particular town, and so is the recording witness. Moshe Alpert, senior cameraman, CBS News. People all over the world look at Israel through their news programs. Part of them are my pictures, but I prefer to show my country through her beautiful nature. Moshe Alpert, photographer of wildlife. My interest in nature began when I was a child. Being a kibbutz child, I grew up among farmers. My kibbutz of Ikim is located in the Jordan Valley, right in the middle of the Great Rift, with hills and mountain in the background. All my life, I was surrounded by nature. And Moshe learned to observe and to record nature with a careful and admiring eye. The same lens that looks on the violence and bloodshed of war and of terrorism in the towns and villages of Israel brings into focus the natural beauties in the surrounding fields. in the skies above. Israel is at the crossroads of the migration routes between three continents. As the heavier birds make the long journey from Europe and Asia into Africa, they need the help of the rising currents of warm air, the thermals, to carry them on their way. These currents develop only over land, so the great migrating flocks bypass large bodies of water like the Mediterranean Sea and fly down the full length of Israel each autumn returning with the spring and providing one of the most breathtaking spectacles in the world of birds. The camera of Moshe Alpert records it all and celebrates its particular graces. The Jordan Valley is the deepest rift on the surface of the earth. It stretches for over a hundred miles from north to south and two and a half thousand feet from sea level to its lowest point. It's a lush strip of green cutting through the desert. But the mountains rise suddenly from the valley and the waters of the Jordan hardly fertilize any land beyond the meadows along its banks. Here the first kibbutzim came to establish themselves. Amongst them was the birthplace of Moshe Alpert, a kibbutz founded by a group of young people who had belonged to a Jewish youth movement in the Soviet Union. They needed a center to help others who escaped to the West. They built fish ponds and grew bananas, grapes, and citrus fruits for export. Kibbutz Afikim is the second oldest kibbutz in Israel, and in terms of its population, it's the largest. Recently, They've built blocks of modern flats, a communal restaurant, and even an outdoor concert area. Today, about 1,500 people are settled in these blocks of modern flats, trying to live out the kibbutz ideal of pooled resources and equal opportunities for all. Their work, their eating, their entertainments, and all their important decision-making processes are communally shared. Private property is discouraged. They aim to be a community of equals, 
prospering through mutual support. Afikim has its own dairy herd, bred and nurtured, using the very latest techniques. But land is in short supply here, and agriculture can't meet all their needs. So they turn to industry. They import timber from West Africa and turn it into plywood, chipboard and veneer at their own kibbutz factory. Moshe Alpert has launched a new venture, electronic picture gathering. He was offered a bonus by CBS News for good work in covering the Lebanon war. He told them that, as a member of a kibbutz, he couldn't accept it personally, but suggested they give the money to the kibbutz to equip it for making wildlife films. Efrat finished her university studies in film and television and then joined Afikim Productions as trainee producer. There was some opposition to the venture from the elders of the kibbutz who thought that photography was all very well as a hobby but shouldn't be taken seriously as a way of earning a living. But the CBS bonus changed their minds. Now Moshe does, as the leader of the team, what he used to do alone. They have a common aim, to show the world the Israel they know, not the battlefield of the newscasts, but a place of peace and of quiet beauty. Across the Jordan Valley are the heights of Golan, some of them steep cliffs that rise uninterrupted to over 4,000 feet and block the rain clouds that sweep across the Sea of Galilee, patching their rocky faces with greenery. It's a region of space and winds. But this is border country, and it's here that Moshe learned his trade as news cameraman. Border incidents were frequent, and the world's media were always hungry. After eight years working for Israeli news, Moshe started with CBS American Network News in 1975, covering all the flashpoints along the frontier. He still comes here even when there's nothing of interest to the newsmen, when all is quiet and the long lens of his camera reaches out into the space over the valley in search of other sites that are special to this place the griffin vulture. Speed, grace and strength combined. For Moshe, it is king of the air. To capture the vulture on the wing is a challenge to any cameraman. The main problem is it's, uh, to keep them on frame in focus. Basically, I need 99% luck and then 1% patience. <laughs> the 1% patience took me about three years. Moshe's experience as a news cameraman were invaluable training for his filming of wildlife because the newsman has one important thing in common with a wildlife photographer. He has no control over what he's filming. Actors on a film set can be programmed to move in predictable ways at predictable speeds so the cameraman can rehearse his framing and his focus. But soldiers in action and wild birds go where they will. Both the speed and the direction of their movements are unpredictable. The camera must constantly change direction and focus. The skills Moshe picked up in street battles help him to follow his birds. Hula at the northern end of the Jordan Valley was once a great lake. 
It was drained in the 1950s by the Jewish National Fund to provide land for settlers. But public pressures demanded that large areas of swampland be left in their natural state to preserve their characteristic flora and fauna. Today, the Hula Reserve is the first of its kind in Israel, a conservation area of worldwide importance, extending over 775 acres. Here, tropical plants thrive in the pure, warm waters. Cypress papyri border the swamps, and the migrating egrets come to rest in their branches. And this is a rich source of spectacular material for Moshe's wildlife films. Heron share the food resources around the swamps with water buffalo. Black-winged stilts probe the marshes around a grazing wild boar. And occasionally demonstrate that territorial aggression here isn't just for humans. Moshe uses his van as a hide. The wild animals of the reserve will often put up with a motor vehicle when they'd take off immediately if a human figure were to appear. And this is where videotape really scores, because compared with film, it's cheap and reusable. If Moshe comes across an interesting situation, he can just keep the video camera running to see how it turns out. Here, the heron has a fish in its bill that's just too big to swallow. What will it do? It daren't put the fish down because there's another hungry heron waiting at its side. Moshe keeps recording and waits. The fish feels heavier and heavier. The heron's neck is getting tired. It puts down the fish on the side away from its rival and takes a drink to lubricate its gullet. By now it seems that the fish is long gone and the meal has been lost. But the herons are master fishermen and don't give up that easily. It sets off again in search of the fish. and the fish slips easily down a wet throat. Another drama with an unpredictable finale opens when a white-tailed eagle starts hunting the shallows. it picks up a terrapin. But then seems unsure what it has landed. Is it alive? Is it edible? The eagle and the terrapin wait. And so does Moshe, keeping the camera recording. The terrapin ends up luckier than the fish. Moshe must always be ready to be called out on another assignment. He leaves the tranquility of the reserve to head for another combat zone. He must revert once more from wildlife photographer to newsman.
but here he may be able to combine the two. The battle-scarred Syrian village of Husnia. It's used by lesser kestrels as a possible nesting site and by Israeli troops for exercises. Lesser kestrels are colonial nesting birds and will often try to take over ruined buildings in the hope of finding shelter to raise their young. The houses look battered enough to be promising. They've been used in the past for target practice, but Moshe comes to wrecky the site just in case it can be left quiet enough to allow the kestrels to settle and hatch a brood. He finds a number of promising nesting sites, holes blasted out of the walls by the shells and bullets of the army exercises, and perfect shelter for the nesting kestrels. But what are the chances of their being left undisturbed? Not, it seems, very good. Sometimes the disturbance caused by human activities can benefit the wildlife around. A ploughed field, for example, is a bountiful hunting ground and birds will be attracted from miles away by the sight and sound of a working tractor. Especially in Israel, the short-toed eagle. This magnificent bird, so successful and resourceful that its range stretches from Europe to China, is also called the snake eagle because its diet is mainly lizards and snakes. These can easily hide away in the pastures but are suddenly exposed by ploughing. As the soil is turned, the short-toed eagle will swoop down and hover over the plough, 30 metres high in the sky its sharp eyes scanning the freshly turned earth, ready to plummet down at the first sign of movement in the soil below. A captured snake is swallowed in the air, inch by inch, and head first. The lie of its scales make it go down more easily that way. But when there's a downy eaglet to be fed, it must first pull out the snake, tail first, and coil it into the nest before it can eat it, beginning again at the head. The short toad is only a medium-sized eagle, but it's still a big bird and needs a large hunting range. Each pair out here seems to need about two to three square miles, and they nest about a mile apart, even when their food is turned up for them. Their nesting habits are unusual for eagles. The nest is small and exposed, and in it they lay one egg a year. Sometimes the eagle will half swallow a snake, just to transport it more easily back to the young at the nest. Eagle watchers will often say that the sight of feeding a fledgling at the nest is one of the rare pleasures they aspire to. Moshe Alpert has recorded it from beginning to end. Back on the kibbutz, out of the sunshine and in the gloom of the editing room of Afikim Productions, 
Moshe arrives to supervise the assembly of his first complete wildlife production. He tells the story of the migration of the white pelican. In making it, Moshe enjoyed his first sustained break from the tensions and the dangers of his work as a news cameraman. Like the birds he so much admires, Moshe felt the need to spread his wings. And to document more fully the behavior of the pelican, he looked beyond the confines of Israel. He chose the Danube Delta, one of the largest pelican colonies in Europe. Each spring, the pelicans return here from their winter migration in Africa, a distance of some 7,000 miles. This is the time that they breed and rear their young, and the delta is home to some 3,000 nesting pelicans. From April to September, he had ample opportunity to capture some of the rare and amusing scenes of the bird's behaviour, especially with the young at feeding time. The food brought home in the stomach of the parent bird is only partly digested, and it's not until the process is complete that the ravenous chick will be allowed to receive it. The young, at around three weeks old, congregate in creches at the water's edge, and the returning parents recognize their chick and feed only their own. To find food, the birds may have to travel up to 50 kilometers. One aspect of the pelican's behavior seemed to Moshe to match admirably the philosophy of the kibbutz, mutual cooperation. Moving forward as a group and simultaneously dipping their heads, they create a large fishing net, trapping schools of fish. He followed the flight of the pelican all the way from the Danube Delta right across Turkey and recorded its arrival in Israel. The production marked a new beginning in his life. Every man has his first love. My pelican film is my first film. So I chose these pelicans as our mascot. I really love them. They can fly all over the world without passport, without money. I envy them. I want to be like them, but of course I can't. So what I do instead is to take beautiful pictures of them. The pelican's first landfall in Israel is the Hula Reserve, where the waters teem with fish. Catfish and carp, St. Peter's fish, that's tilapia, and golden St. Peter's fish. They're so abundant in these waters that there's no need to hunt. So the pelicans just float about and scoop and scoop and float till their bellies are bloated. Sometimes they work up the energy to stray over the hedge into the ponds of the fish farm, and here they're less gladly received. But hostility to birds is rare in Israel. The great annual migrations are welcomed and publicized as a national spectacle. Nature reserves are a source of national pride. There are strict laws protecting the transiting and the resident birds. And even the Israeli Air Force is careful to restrict its flying in areas that are crossed by the migration routes. Moshe's recreations, like most of his work, tend to be taken out in the open air. And for all the communal activities of the kibbutz, there's always the occasion for a get-together with the extended family. 
Today, he's giving a lunch party with his wife, Neely, for a nephew and family on leave from military service. This is time off, but the border is only a kilometre away and he's always on call. Moshe has worked out his own philosophy of the family. He believes that although the human community is part of the natural world, children are closer to its heart. Adults have created what he calls a frame of life, which alienates them from the rest of nature. Children are instinctively aware of this and struggle against the adult frame of life, which closes round them. And Moshe himself is caught up in a demanding frame of life that too often takes him away from his family. His wife insists that he's been married for the past 12 years only to his camera. One may view the fact that I'm both a nature filmmaker and war reporter as paradoxical. I would be a liar if I said that I was never afraid in those situations. Who wouldn't be? Of course I'm afraid, but I'm always so busy concentrating, getting the pictures, that I have no time to think of my safety. Sometimes I feel that the camera is like a three meters wall between me and the shooting. Another border incident is over, safely captured by Moshe's camera and by the sound equipment operated by his assistant, Yossi. Yossi is an Algerian Jew who came to learn the business of filming warfare when a mine blew his right foot off and stopped him taking part in it. Their news gathering is done for the day and they can head for home. But there's just one more border incident that's worth recording. High and free over the barbed wire, the birds that Moshe so much admires and envies float unchallenged over the boundaries that have caused so much shedding of blood. Watching birds, Moshe believes, is not just entertainment. It can make us into better people. If we look at them long enough and hard enough, we may grow to feel that we too are a part of their natural world. And if we can learn to have a better relationship with nature, then it must follow that we shall have better relationships with each other.